thank you to Dr. Roni um, Elk, who is here to join us. This um, meeting is sponsored by our Pediatric Palliative Care um, Special Interest Group, which is an amazing collaboration of many different um, people with interest in pediatric palliative care across many dis different disciplines and many different institutions. And we meet monthly to discuss various themes related to pediatric palliative care. And it's really been an incredible opportunity for sharing research and other um, items of interest. And we um, welcome anybody who's interested. So if you're interested, then please contact us after this talk. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Ronit Elk, who I had heard speak at the um, AHPM meeting last year on a similar topic, and it really was um, incredibly eye-opening to me in um, terms of how much we have yet to do um, in the research that we do, and I will um, allow you all to hear for yourself kind of um, all that she has to say. Um, by way of introduction, um, Dr. Elk is currently a professor in the Center for Palliative and Supportive Care in the Division of Geriatrics, Gerontology, and Palliative Care um, at UAB. But she's had a somewhat unusual career track. She had 10 years in academia, and then you may recognize her name um, if you ever applied for an ACS grant several years ago, as she had been a scientific program officer for the American Cancer Society, and now she's had eight and a half years back in academia. Throughout this long career, her research has always focused on the priority for achieving health equity. Um, so, for example, at ACS, she developed um, a $30 million a year extramural grant program focusing on reducing health disparities in cancer among underserved populations. With funding from the NIH over these last eight years, she's partnered with various underserved communities in developing culturally based healthcare programs for elders with serious illness. She's used the community based participatory research model, and these programs are developed by the community and for the community based on the cultural values and preferences of that community. In partnership with Southern Rural Community members, Dr. Elk's team developed the first culturally-based palliative care intervention in the U.S., which is a healthcare model that takes into consideration the specific values and preferences of Southern rural elders, white and African-American. In another study, a Southern African-American community developed a series of training videos for clinicians caring for older African-Americans with serious illness. Um, the African American community speak to healthcare providers training program. And that's become one that palliative care clinicians around the country participate in. And preliminary data indicates a significant change in clinician behavior by following community made recommendations. Dr. Elk has been awarded the Richard Payne Outstanding Achievement in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Award from the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine and serves as a plenary speaker at the 2020 AHPM meeting that focused on social justice and equity, where she was where she stressed the importance of listening to and partnering with the communities with, we serve. With the awakening of the country to the horrors of racism and the urgent need to achieve health equity, Dr. Elk is now presenting grand rounds and serving as keynote speakers at universities and conferences around the country. And we are thrilled to have her here at Children's. We had originally asked Dr. Elk to come during Palliative Care Month back in November, but um, it is probably equally, if not more fitting to have her come in February, which is um, African-American History Month. So without any further introduction, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Elk. Thank you, everyone, um, for being here. Um, I know that um, your focus is probably primarily on children. So whatever I speak about, just think about it in terms of how it would affect your work um, and your communities. So what I want to talk about today is about um, respecting culture and the experience of racism, particularly with African-American um, community members. And, and what I'll talk a little bit about is what's culture and how it actually impacts the care of seriously ill patients. Um, and then just a tiny bit about understanding African-American patients and then how we develop healthcare programs um, for patients with serious illness, which you could do exactly the same for your patients if they're children, um, teenagers, or for young children with their parents. Um, 
I think we don't really need to go into the definition of culture since everybody knows what culture is. If I had to say to you, what culture do you belong to? You'd instantly know which culture you belong to or cultures you belong to. But what's fascinating to me is, look how little we know about somebody else's culture. We only know 10%. And it's more of the superficial things like, let's say you went to a Greek festival. I used to love going to those. And, and oh, you love the food and the music is fantastic. And those dances, you just want to go in there and start dancing. But what we don't know is 90%, which is a huge amount that we don't know. And those are things that are very, very important, like um, communication style. So I was telling um, the group when I first joined that I spent my life moving from country to country because I come from Israel, my father was sent to many different countries. And one of the things I very much appreciate is that I was taught um, by my family, um, in this culture, you do this. In this culture, you do this. So one of the things was, you see how it says eye contact and body language. And one of the countries, we didn't look at an elder in the eye. You had to look down when you speak to an elder as a mark of respect. Um, and it, that may not be something that we're familiar with in, in the States. Um, different kinds of emotions, showing emotions or not showing emotions. Uh, uh, in Israel, people just say it out the way they want to. And then I was working in South Carolina where people are so polite. It was just like, whoop, two different extremes, like uh, on a continuum. Look at the last thing um, that we're talking that is on this chart, which is decision making, problem solving. How key is that for, for um, I'm going to talk about palliative care, but you could think about it about any patient that you have who is um, having a serious illness or even dying. And what we know is if we think of our own culture or your loved one's culture, we perceive serious illness or suffering or dying through our own cultural lens. That's how we perceive it, through our own cultural lens. I'm going to very quickly go over four different key areas, um, how culture influences aspects of um, serious illness. And the reference is there at the bottom. And if you need uh, more information, I'm happy to send it to you. Basically, think about the process of care. We always think, well, everybody needs to know about their prognosis. We must tell them their prognosis, otherwise, how will they plan? Well, it turns out not every culture wants to know about it, and not every culture wants to know what, what you want to tell them about it. The level of family involvement in care decisions is very, very different by culture. Things like timing, process of death, and the place of death, Oh, that varies tremendously. I heard somebody say, um, there's this term that we have, I don't know why, um, called a good death. And I've heard people in the community absolutely be astounded by that term that we so you know, nonchalantly use in medicine. Um, if somebody's monitoring the chart, ch oh, you just told them, okay, Shana, I, I wasn't sure if anybody had a question. If there's any clarification question, something I didn't explain well, feel free to ask or just put in the chat and Dr. Jacobs will ask me and otherwise we'll leave time at the end. You know, the way of talking about certain things, as I said, um, talking about prognosis, talking about the time to death in some cultures, it's comp and especially in some African American cultures, it saying, mm, I think your loved one has about a week, if, you know, based on my experience and what's happening with this organ and that organ, it's not appropriate. It's not at all appropriate. And I'll explain why when we get to that. Um, so here we are doing all these things that we sure are right. Culture also influences the meaning of illness. In some, in some religions, it might be. I, I, I deserve to have physical pain or emotional pain for whatever it is that I did. And then de decision making. So there's a whole thing um, um, that we're not going to talk about now in sociology about whether it's an individualist culture, which in the United States in generally it's very much is. What does the patient want? What does the individual want? And we're so proud of ourselves that we're doing something that the patient wants. However, in a culture which is a, a sort of a, where there's group connectedness, a collectivist culture, um, 
it, it, we call it Ubuntu in Africa, but it's also called Ubuntu. It, it, that term is used also among African-American with the group connectedness is, central, is, is the most important. And so, for example, one time in Africa, I asked somebody, how are you doing? And she said, oh, the people, they are suffering. And so I was struck by two things. One is, oh, the people. I'm sure I asked about her. And then it took a second. And then I went, oh, when she talks about herself, she means the people. And then they are suffering. Whether she herself is suffering or not, um, it is suffering. Um, so that's something that we need to think about. In some cultures, yep, it's the doctor that has the ultimate authority. In others, it's God. God decides when we're going to live and when we're going to die. We want God to give the wisdom to the doctor to understand and to know and to care for and to treat my loved one. <laughs> but when you say, you know, you have this much of time and that much of time, you're not God. So um, really, you, you can't really say it or I'm not going to believe you. And then, of course, this whole push that we have in the U.S. about how we have to have advanced care directives written in writing, despite the huge problems we have in it. You know that in certain cultures it's not acceptable for various reasons, which we unfortunately don't have time for. But people talk to other family members and they may be the ones who know. Here's the problem. End of life care values in the United States are historically rooted in values that represent the culture value, the culture and the religious values of the white middle class. If your patient or you are white middle class, no problem. You're doing everything right. And these values may not at all be appropriate for other ethnic or cultural groups. And what happens is a lack of sensitivity and a lack of respect for cultural differences, which you may not even be aware of. So it's not like you're doing anything wrong out of meanness. You're just not aware of it. It can significantly compromise care for minority patients. Um, and when I say minority, it could be any minority. It could be somebody who's a refugee from another country. It could be an LGBT community. It could be obviously African-American. It could be somebody, um, Hindu patients, because we don't understand the culture and therefore we treat them what we think the way is the right way. And what happens is the care is compromised. It says here politely may, but in fact it is. And Dr. Peria Coyle, a colleague of mine, um, and, 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 or, and any palliative care um, clinicians. She is um, in, in, in California and she talked about how we really need to find qu culturally competent care. Um, she put it as a significant public health crisis, not having it. <laughs> um, and I wrote a grant once and one of the reviewers said, it is not. <laughs> it was like, okay, you think it's not. Um, but let me give you the reasons why we think it is. So how do we provide culturally concordant care to African-American patients? And I use African-Americans because they're the ones closest to my heart, um, even though I'm not African-American, obviously, um, but, but substitute any other group you want in your head um, that's important to you. So the first step is to understand the cultural values and the care preferences as well as in this particular group, the lived experiences of systemic racism. And not that none of you, I mean, not that all, all of you know this. And, and obviously I am not speaking from a personal experience. Um, I am speaking from, uh, when I came to this country, I immersed myself in African-American history, uh, literature, um, everything that happened and everything that's going on. Um, and and have worked with many African-American communities and, and base all of this on basically um, what I have learned and what has been shared with me. Um, we know from the Holocaust um, that the memory is so horrific that it stays in the DNA for future generations. The same is true in slavery and racism. And one of the things that people think, well, since the last murder, well, it wasn't the last murder, but since the murder and, and things have changed and, and we've all become so much more aware, well, it still affects the daily, daily, daily life 
of every single person that you know or you may come across who's African-American every single day. It's either individual racism or systemic racism. Um, another thing that's important to know about African-American communities, um, the Pew, studies, Pew um, um, Foundation does studies to look at religion across the nation. And African-Americans, um, almost eight, over 80% believe in God with absolute certainty. And so it's God who's in charge, et cetera. And here we are saying, well, your body's you know, shutting down, this score is this way and that way, and you probably won't last a week. Yes, physiologically, we probably know that. But if God is in charge, and <laughs> wait a minute, there's a big discrepancy. Um, and religion's very important. And they attend religious service at least once a week. That's half of the community, once a week at least. Um, it's a very large proportion. And for those who believe in God, the church is fundamental to all being, all knowledge, all of life's vision. So it's not just the spiritual part. The church teaches us everything, everything about life, everything about death, everything about how to be, everything about social justice, everything is all in the church. Everything, everything about hospice or, or not taught about hospice, it all comes from the church. And the pastor's role is key. And how I fault the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine is that when, when we brought a, a panel um, of African-American speakers to AHPM, maybe five, six years ago, um, we invited a pastor. And somebody said, um, oh, this is the first African-American pastor we've had. And so I said, oh, but maybe you don't treat African-American patients. Maybe you don't have African-American patients that way. No, no, we, we treat a large percentage of my patients African-American. And you didn't invite pastors you didn't have conversations with African-American pastors. <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. It's like having medicine without, let's say, without disrespect. It's having medicine without the doctors. So let's do medicine, only have every other profession, but no doctors. <laughs> that's ludicrous. Well, that's how ludicrous we still are. And that's when I was saying that God is in charge. Um, and the belief in hope and miracles is prevalent in 85% of African Americans. And what that means is that you're saying there's no cure, get them off this machine, um, call it aggressive care, etc. And yet, here's a person and their family believing in hope and miracles, and you are discounting them. The other thing is that the um, family and community is the focus, just like in Africa, in the African country, it's not just the individual, it's the whole family and the community. Now, everything that I'm saying is obviously generalizing, generalizing, generalizing. Of course, there may be very many people where this is all very different, but in the, in the, in the general scheme, that's how it is. Now, one of the things that's important to know, particularly for those of us in the South, I have no idea how it is in DC. Um, I should imagine it's the same. There is a huge distrust in the healthcare system. And I, I, some, sometimes I feel like I'm trying to get my colleagues to understand this. And everybody says, yeah, 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 I know about Tuskegee. Well, it's not just Tuskegee. It, there's a whole history of medical experimentation on black Americans, a whole history. In fact, the person who is talked about as, oh, the father of obstetrics operated on, on, on African American uh, slaves with no anesthesia. How that is allowed to happen, I don't know. And then you think, okay, so those things happened, but now we're in a different century, we're different time, everything's fine. No, we're not. The word disparity, and we know that there are so many disparities, means a difference. But it doesn't mean, okay, your, your treatment is different than mine or your outcome is, it means inferior, less than. So as long as we continue to have disparities in care, disparities in outcome, it is us in the healthcare system that is doing something very, very wrong. I'm gonna give you an example. 
Um, even though palliative care is a very new field and is probably constituted out of the nicest human beings on this planet, which is why I came back to um, um, academia because I met these palliative care researchers and I was so impressed by the, these incredible people. I wanted to work with them. Um, and yet pain isn't as assessed as well and it isn't as managed as well. And so you can imagine what happens. And goals of care, and this is not just from one study, multiple studies, the less often discussed by physicians, these are not necessarily just palliative care physicians at all, but they're less often discussed by physicians, less often recorded by physicians in the chart, even when there has been a conversation. And then even when African-Americans have goals of care written in the chart, they're not followed or respected. I mean, I don't know what to say other than this is appalling. One of the things that I learned from COVID is a term that I was not familiar with, and maybe all of you are, I wasn't, and it's called syndemics, and it's a coll collusion of epidemics. We all know uh, that COVID was an epidemic, but what we didn't know and what we should have known and what people do know is that it is also, there was another epidemic, which is racism, systemic racism. And the two collided together. When these two epidemics collided together, that's what happened. Um, it's called syndemics. This paper by Dr. Potier in the Annals of Epidemiology is superb if you ever want to read it. Um, and in fact, I just saw a paper in JAMA Psychiatry talking, talking about the long-term effects of COVID in, in underserved communities, how racism has impacted the negative outcomes, not only physical, but mental, sociological um, in the community, um, horrific. When, one of the things that sort of makes me feel a little bit more um, well, not optimistic, but semi-optimistic, is the fact that this country has woken up. The rest of the world woke up too, but all of a sudden we have the NIH, the American Medical Association, all kinds of associations suddenly saying, oh, systemic racism is a public health crisis, acknowledging what we have known for hundreds of years and what we've been shouting about for years and yet not having it acknowledged. The NIH now, for the first time this year, had an application for grants where you could apply for grants on dismantling systemic racism, not individual, systemic. Um, and the outcomes are absolutely shocking in terms of um, the way the policies um, have disadvantaged one group or another. That's why there's, oh, well, they have pre-existing conditions. Well, how do those pre-existing conditions occur? Um, and, and, and how did they become overrepresented in certain kinds of, position, of um, work? And how is it that they had unequal access to healthcare? And how is it that they weren't allowed to live in certain neighborhoods, et cetera? And so, all these factors are, have woken up this country to a realization about what effect systemic racism has. And um, you're on the healthcare field and you know what effect this can have on, on the human body, um, how housing insecurity, lower income, lower education, mass incarceration, um, it, it just causes huge amounts of horrific stress on the human body and on human communities and so on. I tell you all this, not because you didn't know it, you do know it. It's just because the effect is huge. And so how is it that we're going to change it? There are ways, there are strategies for change and there's many different ways. And so what we need to do we can either get overwhelmed and say, I can't deal with it, or we can each take a responsibility to either address or confront or dismantle personal racism, systemic racism, and disparities in healthcare. Um, and here's the first step. When I wrote this paper in, in 2016, it was um, we, we edited a special issue on um, end of life care and palliative care for African-Americans. The response of people to read it was minimal, 
very few people read it um, and, and looked at it, which is, you know, indicates how people just obviously didn't care at the time or totally weren't aware. And so one of the things that I wrote in the editorial is how important it is that each and every one of us in some way recognize and acknowledge to the patient and the family the inequity and the disrespect and the disregard our African-American patients have experienced. If you could just have that in your consciousness, I realize just reading something like this isn't going to change anybody, um, but I just want to put it out there as a thought. So one of the things that you can get in um, strategies for change is to conduct community outreach and engagement and um, increase Oh, wait, that's not the right word. Provide culturally competent care. I'm sorry, the red box is in the wrong place. So we chose those two methods, community outreach and culturally uh, competent care in palliative care. So we use a social justice method. And there's a paper that um, I wrote with a colleague about using social justice in developing equitable programs in palliative care. Um, and if anybody wants a copy of that, I'll be glad to send it to Dr. Jakes and she can share with you. Um, but it's a social justice approach um, and it's called community-based participatory research. And everybody lovingly calls it CBPR. What is it? It's a partnership. It's a partnership based in the community. That's why those fancy words. And what it is, it's a proven method, it's proven. Do you know how we always want evidence-based strategies? Well, we have a lot of evidence-based, a lot of evidence that this reduces the disparities. So that means it's on a way to achieve health equity. So public health uses this very wise, widely. It's a public health approach that's used very much in public health. And so does count, can, uh, cancer prevention strategist or any other health prevention, but medicine, no. Palliative care, not at all until we started doing it and now it's changing. And I'm very happy to play a role in that. But here public health has known it. In fact, there's a wonderful paper in the Lancet um, calling on palliative care to do this, to engage in community partnerships in order to get equitable care. Um, why is it a social justice method? Well, because what this, what this uh, it's actually not really a method, it's more of an approach, but researchers uh, form equal partnerships. And when I say equal, I mean equal. I don't mean, okay, we have a board of people, they give us advice and then we do what we want. No, it's the community that gives us advice. And the goal is to work in partnership in, on some problem that's in the community and who makes the recommendations, it's the community. I can't tell you how different this is for others. And I'll give you a very good example in a few minutes, um, how, how it's so out of the norm for most people. And so basically our goal is to develop healthcare programs based on the community's cultural values and the community's lived experiences, not on ours, on what the community experienced. So how do we do this? Well, first we um, convene an advisory group. The, they're not the same as an advisory group that hospitals have saying, oh, I have a stakeholder group. Um, those are usually for fundraising and sort of keeping people in the loop. This is for people, um, if you are interested, for example, in children with X illness, it would include um, the parents of, or grandparents or whatever of those children. Um, they have experience with the issue. So we were interested in people who, who had lost a loved one. And so you could have people who either had lost a loved one or, or, or depending on what the goal of your study is, and I could help you with that. You always include leaders and well-respected members because they're the ones who are gatekeepers. They keep let you into the community or not. Um, they're the ones who keep the community um, updated. That's why you have to have pastors in the African-American community um, and hospital or hospice staff, because when you put together these uh, programs, um, you, it has to be feasible for the hospital to implement. Um, in this picture, you will see 
um, a group that we had that was African American and white, um, and that's because the hospital would <laughs> would not let me work only with the African American community. They wanted to do it. Whatever you do for the blacks, you do for the whites. So we worked in partnership, which took a while to negotiate to get everybody to be able to trust each other. The other thing is that the community is involved before you start, before you start, you don't come there and say, okay, I've got all this plan, what do you think? No, you start before and then during and, and what after each step. So after you, even after you've finished everything, it belongs to the community. So whatever you've created, whatever the community's created comes back to the community. Um, and, and you really have to listen. Somebody told me, oh, this is, a listening method. I was like, yes, a listening and respecting method. Exactly. You listen and you hear, and then you follow the advice. Even if it's what, that's not what we planned. What, that's not going to work in a hospital. What, that's not, that's what the community wants. If you want it to be effective, that's what you have to do. And of course, to recognize that it takes time and, and genuine respect to build and establish trust. So this, this study that where we developed the first culturally based palliative care intervention took four years. Some people say three, I think it's three and a half is more accurate. But the members, we met every single month and where did we meet? At the community. So I would drive down two hours and drive back in the dark like this. I'm terrible. Um, my night vision was very bad. I had no idea. Once I had cataracts removed, it was better, but I was determined You go to the community. And so I would drive down there, we'd bring food and, and you see everybody has papers there. We would, talk, we would have a notes and, and nobody missed, nobody misplaced their notes, nobody lost them, everybody had everything. And nobody missed monthly meetings. You just think, wait, for four years, nobody missed monthly meetings? Well, that shows a level of commitment. Well, really, the one lady who was sitting in front of the palm tree, she did miss a meeting because she's a widow. And a widow were, he came to the church where she was, I think he had his eye on her because he came to her service where he used to come to the later service. Anyway, they got together and they ended up getting married. So when they got married, it wasn't in the town. So the group said, okay, you can have permission to miss this one meeting. <laughs> so she missed this meeting, but with the group's permission. And with this method, we developed a culturally based palliative care um, consult. It's a palliative care consult, which is for um, uh, geared towards African American and white, and it's built on the lived experiences and the cultural values of each of them. And can't see. There's some differences between the two groups, and and I'll show you some of the differences. We'll go through some of the differences. Oops. Um, like how to connect with families, that's one way. How to discuss prognosis, those are differences. I'll, I'll go over that in a minute. Um, and so um, it took four years, as I say, to develop. And it's the first ever culturally based palliative care developed by the community and for the community. So it's in a journal called Health Equity, if you're interested in it. Um, one of the things I was going to ask is if you're a clinician, just read table 12. Table 12 tells you, um, I've summarized one or two things here, but it tells you exactly what the community wants. So the um, um, introducing yourself to the patient, how difficult could this be? Well, the African-Americans, first of all, they asked us not to be rude. Um, why? Because they've had a lot of experiences where clinicians have been, physicians particularly, have been very rude. None of these were palliative care physicians, but others were very rude. So, okay, please do not be rude. I mean, it seems awful to have to say this. And the African-Americans said two things. First of all, don't call me by my first name. You do not know me. Um, and if I invite you to, sure. But if not, have respect. The second thing is take time and make time to get to know something about the family. So whatever it is, oh, your son plays sport, or you were in the military, or your grandfather was um, as a church elder, whatever it is, learn something about the family, and then say it back so that the people hear, this is a way of building trust. And just to get connected with the patients, this is what they asked. The second thing is about advanced directives. 
Um, it's going to be in, in verbally because percentage wise around this country, um, very low level of advanced directives, very low likelihood of it being written. Um, but the loved one will know she will have, or he or she will have told the loved one. And then again, this whole thing about prolonged care, it's not aggressive care. We are writing a paper on that. I realize this is a tricky issue. Um, and, and yes, it is aggressive. What do you mean it's aggressive? We're keeping them on this machine. There's absolutely no chance of them coming back to life. We're causing them suffering. So I'm not talking about when suffering. It's costing the hospital a lot of money. Yes, it is, um, but the patient has a right because the patient in the patient and the family's eyes, it's in God's hands and God will decide. And you know what? This is not just African-American. There are lots of other groups who have the same thing. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I realize it's, it's not an easy thing to say, well, stress hope, um, but, but even if you agree with the patient, yes, it's in God's hands. Um, and if you're, if you're comfortable praying with the family, please do so. Um, uh, as you know, I'm from Israel, I'm Jewish. I have prayed more times with African-Americans um, than, than probably with Jewish people. Um, it's, it's just a mark of respect. Um, so together, um, we created a palliative care program that was culturally appropriate for each of them. So we tried it out in the small rural hospital just to see. So here you've created something. Now you have to do a little feasibility study to see, is it going to work? Is it going to be accepted? What if they don't want it? Oh, one of the things that we did it was through telehealth because there were no palliative care docs at the time. None, zero, no not docs, no nurses, nothing, um, and no primary palliative care. So... Um, we had to use telehealth. And when we told people about telehealth, the, the focus group people were like, what? It was like going to the moon. So this is about um, eight years ago. So think about it. It wasn't like we're all familiar with Zoom or um, seeing each other on, on FaceTime and so on. No, it was absolutely a shock to the group. And so we asked them, so how, what would make it acceptable? Um, and one of the things that they suggested is let us approach the patients and let us tell the patients that we want to, um, to tell that we created this uh, program. Um, and so that helped. And most of the patients and families accepted it. And they were those who did were very satisfied. And the community has ownership. So it's the first such program, but you know that it's just a small pilot study. So now we have a, a randomized control trial. It's in three, because we did this in rural, we could only extrapolate to rural areas. So we have three hospitals in three states, Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina, African-American and white patients. Um, each, each community, each site has a, an advisory group um, that, that advises us on things and that approaches the patients. Um, what the patients either receive regular care that they receive in the hospital, or in addition, they receive a palliative care consult where they were trained um, with um, that this culturally based uh, uh, program. The community trained the physicians. I should have had a slide on that. What a bummer. I have a great 15 minute video if anybody wants to see that. It's pretty amazing. We took the palliative care docs down to the area we took them down to, um, to Buford, South Carolina. We showed them what it was like. They had to do a cultural immersion, no feet, uh, phones, no beepers, no nothing for two and a half days. Um, and then the community, we sat around the table and the community told them to do this, to speak that way, to do that, to speak that way. And then we did role plays and things. It was pretty amazing. Very, very amazing. Um, and, and for most people, it's like, what? The community trained the docs? Oh, and the community was like, oh, these physicians are going to come there with their noses up in the air. And they're not going to listen. And of course, these are all palliative care docs. And they were so nice. And they were like, wow, what amazing people these physicians are. So what I wanted to tell you, it's a model. It's, it's a model. Yes, we created it with one group, but it's being replicated. So somebody in Ghana and somebody in Puerto Rico, both of these are, are clinicians who are not at all researchers, but who knew that they wanted to give something um, that's culturally appropriate for their community. Dr. Patel, he works in North Carolina. He's, he's a palliative care doc. 
Um, and he is going to be doing it with the Hindu population. Simultaneously now, I'm mentoring three different people who are working with lesbians, um, gay men, and transgender men and women to um, find out what their cultural values are. So all these projects are ongoing right now. And one of the things that I realized is that um, just like you, I've been giving talks all over, like you invited me, I've been giving talks all over the country because people really want to make a difference. They really do. So we have uh, anybody who wants to participate in this intensive, it's a five day intensive. And when I say intensive, it's intensive. And you have to participate in all five days and you will learn how to do this. You do not, I stress not, have to be a researcher to do it. Um, as I say, we had half of the people were straight up physicians who had never done research, but really wanted to make a difference. Um, and so it's a training. You have to apply. We can only take like 40 people, something like that, because we have small groups with facilitators. Um, and then following this, those who want to do studies, then I mentor them in that part. And then those who get funded studies, one of the study managers on my study helps them walk through step by step by step. So you're never alone in this process. Um, and so we use, again, I'm not gonna give you another example. We use this same method, CBPR, to develop a training. And this is a training for clinicians. And how did we do it? We didn't do it, the community did it. We partnered with another community, African-American community. And as a result of the, of the study, they develop videos, videos telling physicians or clinicians. It started off, they wanted to tell physicians, um, and then it said, okay, any clinician um, based on their values and their specific, have the clinician, the thing has um, specific messages. And then we have an educator, a partner with an educator, and he put it in a training module based on adult-based learn, adult learning skills. I had no idea there was such a thing. I'm not an educator and he did. And so we've done it. And more than a hundred clinicians have been trained. And this is the one that's happening around the country. And we are monitoring how people are changing practice or not. So there's a huge demand for this training. It's called African-American Community Speak. The, communities, the community gave it the name themselves. And if your group ever wants to, um, you can contact Jared, who's on here. If you don't remember, then just email me and I'll put you in touch. And we do this training several times, um, several times a year. Um, it's quite fascinating to see. And so basically um, what, what, what you see is that the way we've done this is in four different steps. It may seem like, oh my gosh, there's so much to do. How can we do it? Well, Here's something that the researchers, when I say researchers, I need to change that to say researchers and clinicians, because if you use this method, I will guide you through it. But you listen to the voices of the community and the community could be whoever you feel needs the help and the community feels they want the help. And then you build the programs based on the community values. It's the researchers or the clinicians together with the community. And then the educators, I mean, this partner that I work with, his name is Dr. Barnett, for those of you who know, is, most, is the most incredible educator I have ever met in my life. When he started this training program, I used to be so upset that people didn't get it. They didn't get what the community wanted. And at the end of it, I have tears running down my face. And people, oh, they got it. And he's very, very patient. And people around the country are now asking him, oh, can, can we develop this for us? Um, and they imp we implement this in healthcare, um, healthcare settings. Um, I thought I had a few extra slides that seemed to be missing on how the community created it. So let me take a step back and tell you how the community created this. Um, is, is, is that the first we listened to the community, we had an advisory board, then the community um, met, the community um, um, met with us, told us who we should talk to. We had two sets of focus groups. One focus group was community members with either serious illness, usually you can't really have people with serious illness because the illness impedes their being able to participate, but family members. And then the other one was of pastors because pastors 
care for their congregants. So we had two groups. And out of those two groups, we had focus groups. And we, when you get the results of focus groups, you analyze themes. What themes come out? Theme is something that comes out very often, very important, very key. And so then once we got the themes, we came back to the advisory group and we said, okay, here's the themes. Now, how are you going to create a training program based on the themes? And I showed them Vital Talk, you know, the videos of Vital Talk. Some of you may be familiar. It's a way of how to communicate um, with a patient, giving bad news and so on. Well, they were not that happy in that particular video in that the patient was um, given bad news alone. And the whole room erupted. And I didn't understand until people said, how could he give the bad news alone? How could he give it to her when she's alone? And so they decided, no, we're going to make our own videos. So I hired a videographer and we had a videographer. And then the group had to, out of all the themes, let's say there were 10 themes. I can't remember how many there were. They had to prioritize which four themes they wanted because we could only do so many uh, financially. We could only do so many videos. So they chose the first four. And then they chose, so I said, how are you going to do it? I thought they would stand up and like somebody would preach and say, this is what you have to do if you're, if you're talking with African-Americans. No, they decided to do a skit. And as you can see here, there's skits being acted out. And they wrote the script, they acted in it, um, they, they chose who was going to be acting in it and so on. Um, one of the things that I wanted to tell you is when we did this training at the AHPM this year, we did part of it. And one of the, we break into small groups and discuss things. And one of the palliative care dogs who was really fascinated by this, he just, his mind, he, 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 he couldn't get it that it was the community that created it, the community that acted it, the community that chose the words, the community that said, this is how it has to be. And then all of a sudden, so I reminded him, I said, I just want to remind you about that. And he stopped and he went, oh, that changes everything. Like he suddenly got it that he had to hear what the community wanted. And it's not, it's not anything bad on him. It's just, when, when have you seen a video created by community members? You don't, you see actors, you see um, clinicians teaching, you see nurses teaching, but you don't often see community members doing it. So that was kind of a shock for him. Um, and um, anybody who wants to sign up for this training, it's only three hours. This is no, not an intensive thing, it's just three hours. Um, and it's fascinating um, to see how people get it. Um, and so these are the four steps. We listen to the voice of the community, researchers and clinicians. Then we build programs together in partnerships. The educators train um, the, the clinicians, and then you as clinicians implement these programs in healthcare settings. In fact, I thought all I was gonna do was build these programs with the community, and then it would get implemented, that's it. Well, I went to a talk, and in the talk, it was on implementation. And it said, oh, they're about 14 years before something comes out until it's implemented. And I am going to be 70 at the end of this month. And I was, oh, no, 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 no. I don't have time to wait 14 years until these people get it. They will get it before I die. <laughs> and that's why I partnered with Michael. And that's why we work on this training thing. And so those of you who are clinicians may say, okay, fine, I hear about your research stuff, not interested, sounds too complicated, too long, too intense, tell me what I can do now. Okay, so I'll tell you. Um, this comes from a wonderful paper from Dr. Kagawa Singer, and it's called, um, um, You Gotta Go Where He Lives. I love it. You gotta go where he lives, which is exactly the point. And I'll go through A, B, C, D, E things. And basically, what are the attitudes? What are the, ask yourself, 
ask the patient, ask the family, what are the patient's attitudes towards diagnosis? Do you want to hear about the diagnosis? How do you want to hear about it? Um, what are your religious and spiritual beliefs? Um, how can I respect your religion and your spirituality? Gain some context about the cultural background. Um, what is important? Is your church very important? Um, how, will this, how will this impact them? Will your community be there to support you and so on? And find out how they make decisions. How do you want to make the decision about whether to carry on with treatment or not? Don't ask just the patient. If the patient wants to defer autonomy, for example, to the pastor, invite the pastor. If the patient wants to have the whole family there, please do so. I have seen people say, well, I walked into a room and there were 14 people in that room in that sort of mocking voice. Well, let me tell you, that is what's culturally appropriate. Come to Israel anytime and see how many people fit into one room and are going to be involved in the decision making. We have to be respectful of how the patient and the family wants it. And finally, obviously understanding what resources are available for the, for the patient in that community. I mean, it's so often, um, you probably know this about opioids and how they lack of availability in certain areas. Then speak to the social worker. Let's see if she can find some other sources of support for that. So this is the ABCDE. Um, obviously, I'm just sort of giving it to you quickly, but if you're really interested, look at that article. And um, finally, I want to end um, so that we have a few minutes of, for talking, but I want to end by saying, I know this country was very moved and I'm very, very touched that physicians and nurses and healthcare workers, all of you took the stand and said, white coats for black lives. What I'm appealing to everybody is let's not make this a one-time, one movement uh, situation. Let's make it a forever situation. Let's commit each and every one of us to doing whatever we can to ensure that we respect all our patients and that there is no more disparity and that there is health equity.